Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show, recording live on Monday, December 9th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 40. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have another airbag recall. And do you know about North America's first school shooting? Hint, it's not Columbine. But first... The Arizona Mushroom Society has a mission to provide educational and scientific opportunities for members to learn about mushrooms in a hands-on environment. Just blow the spores. The society hosts dozens of workshops throughout the year. Members also have the opportunity to trek to areas across Arizona to look for precious fungi. Mushrooms can be used in teas, broths, and medicinal remedies, but it takes a careful eye to determine which are poisonous and which are safe to eat. This group knows enough about mushroom species to understand oh. not... Did you like that squeak? Yeah, that was pretty nice. Actually, <laughs> let's go back for our audio listeners. This is some audio ASMR. Let's check this out. Which are safe to eat. This group knows enough about mushroom species to understand... That just sounded... <laughs> it sounded like a very large mushroom. I know. <laughs> does that sound... It that sounded like they were taking a hacksaw through it or something. It sounded... That's a mushroom. That thing's going to make a soup for a family. <laughs> I know. A large... Maybe a large community. Not to eat them yes, before sir. they're properly identified. This one, I believe we are calling Brusula atroglauca. And these mushrooms also bring balance to the forest. Based on the weather in this part of Arizona, foragers said this season was decent, but not the best. Uh, some years are definitely spottier than others. It has not been the juiciest year. The study found that these forest gems do well in areas with more rain at the beginning of the season and warmer temperatures at the end, like some Arizona mountains. Every monsoon season is different in different areas, but those that time is a very small frame and a very small window. Mushroom hunters are taking advantage of this window of opportunity by hitting the trails all around the state. That is pretty cool. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, I, I've been noticing a weird mushroom push with this article, too. Because my, my friend, she emailed me letting me know about that they published some mushroom guide. So mm. it's kind of weird. Well, but, the mushrooms are thriving in certain areas, yeah. like they said, because of the certain season they thrive when the it's really wet early in the season and then warmer later that's something that i want to explore in the pacific northwest yeah the All mushrooms the, yeah because i think the biggest mushroom is in oregon or something so i don't know the pacific northwest is famous for mushrooms nice awesome <laughs> cnbc television cannabis operators face difficulty staying compliant in california you drive all over la you can see the billboards promoting legal cannabis but if you really want to make money in this industry get into compliance because operators are finding out how tough it is to follow all of california's rules operators like Melissa Etheridge, who has spent years trying to get her business off the ground. I've been and the native ad begins for Melissa Etheridge. Just letting you all but know, I cut out a lot of stuff. Just but I was going to say, uh, <laughs> is anyone surprised that it's hard to follow California yeah, it, law? It's, but. <laughs> Best of personally, uh, you it's, know, six figures. You'll see. There's <laughs> easily over almost seven. Etheridge says cannabis helped her during. How much did Melissa Etheridge have to spend? Melissa Etheridge, who has spent years trying to get her business off the ground. I years. Mean, personally, uh, you know, six figures easily. Six over figures. Almost seven. Etheridge says cannabis helped her during chemotherapy. She doesn't just want to license her name. She wants to build a business from the ground up. It's called Etheridge Farms. She finally got the first manufacturing license for Santa Cruz County. Hopes to have product this summer. She compares the struggle here to her struggle back when she was trying to land a record label. Ethics oh. Farms is not easily, you know, oh, let's go sell it and make a whole bunch of money because we are dedicated to compliance and to medicinally present this to the world. What's happening in California is a tragedy. Now, Etheridge hired Julie Crockett. She does cannabis compliance for consulting form MMLG. She says nobody is compliant. For example, California cannabis law says you can't give away freebies. That means your salespeople can't hand out free samples <laughs> oh at trade gosh. shows to buyers. And everybody does that. And so nobody's compliant. Oh my. <laughs> it's always back California. Nobody's compliant with anything. Not oh. everyone the recycling. Nobody's compliant. It's just across the board. There's no compliance on anything. Overregulated uh, California. Nobody's compliant. This Ooh, is so frustrating. Wow, we're so surprised. Guess what? The state is also raising taxes on the legal uh, industry now. Oh no, the states, so that's even going to mean everyone, more people will fall out of compliance because that just, you, ah. And who does that hurt when they tax? Poor people. Yeah. Next month. 
the way that taxes have inflated the prices and made the industry unable to compete with a wildly successful illicit market is demoralizing for the operators who are licensed and trying to do it compliantly. The state has about 50 enforcement officers. They've really been overwhelmed. They haven't gotten around to compliance enforcement much in a meaningful way, but stay tuned. <laughs> 50 compliance officers for however many to speak yeah. cover unhealthy you can go through our show notes and find it there are a lot of it's <laughs> and if you live in california you know how quickly those shops yeah pop, pop up, up and then go away and then there little yeah. pop-up shops everywhere it's hilarious this, this is, is what oh i'm just frustrated yeah we should not be regulating the marijuana marijuana should be accessible to everybody especially in california where the climate is perfect for it to grow because it does not snow yeah and what about people that aren't rich, like Melissa Etheridge, where she can spend... And Yeah, to get all California compliant, but the yeah. small businesses, they're going to be out. This is what's yeah. going to happen. Look at what's happening with vape. It always It's going to happen. That's why we need to fight back and say, no, we're going to grow it ourselves. Yeah. Screw you, Melissa Etheridge. Sorry, like your music, but we don't need, to, we don't need your weed. We don't need yeah. your commercial weed. You do it not just... want to help people. You want to sell, you want to sell them marijuana. You want to sell... Yeah, you're not. Yeah, you're running a business. It's a business, and it's so frustrating because it's punishing the people that are need it. Yeah, that need really it. need it and can't get it. Am I right? Yeah, <laughs> not to cut you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Associated Press scientists create monthly birth control pill. Ooh. In this case, we have developed uh, an oral pill that can be taken once every month, and that can give you a prolonged. Uh, drug concentrations for an oral contraceptive. So the system that we developed looks somewhat like a starfish. So it has uh, six different arms associated with it, and the six arms are joined together at uh, a central core. Now the central core allows the dosage form to be folded up and placed into a gelatin capsule, okay? Once the patient takes this... Yeah, it does not look pleasant. It's a, it's a big looking pill. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah suppository gelatin ah, capsule ah. the gelatin capsule dissolves and the system opens up i think there is definitely potential in the pill that a woman can take once a month instead of every single day the reason why is that it can be hard to remember to take a pill every day change a patch every week or change a vaginal ring every month and so Wait. some women are she said it's hard to change a ring every month but then that's a pill every month that's the same frequency yeah but a pill is easier Easier to remember. So it so might what, be. I People are okay with taking pill. pills, but yeah, it's a huge pill. So then, so and again, you, is that a suppository? It was kind of. I think it's kind of no, big. No, but you touched on something that people would rather take a pill because people were so sexually repressed that instead of fishing a ring out of your vagina, you'd rather mm, take the huge interesting pill. or take a suppository. <laughs> <laughs> think about that. <laughs> Why not? Can't it be a suppository? I don't know. Because <laughs> you'd buy a poop. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> eight, eight seconds left. Let's go back just a little bit. It can be hard to remember to take a pill every day, change a patch every week, or change a vaginal ring every month. And so some women are more comfortable with taking pills because that's what they're used to. Having the option of a pill to take once a month could be a great option to give women choices in birth control. Yeah, science alert. The experimental capsule is still years away from drugstores, but researchers reported Wednesday that it worked as designed in key tests in animals. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is investing $13 million for further development of the once-a-month pill in hopes of eventually improving family planning options in developing countries. So that's I'm probably the test, that's probably the market for it, it's the developing countries, uh, which would make sense in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's still years out, but very interesting. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. We always do. Is you know supposed to hang out there? Which the the results look promising with the pig model. Apparently, our digestive tract is similar to pigs. Wow. Yeah. So they tested on that. But what happens if you throw up or something? <laughs> I assume you're kind of yeah out of luck or Ooh, does it not come up? I don't know. I'm sure they're gonna have to. Test. I'm sure yeah, they're I'm testing for that one. <laughs> <laughs> throw up a ninja star. <laughs> Doesn't sound too pleasant. Uh, CBS Evening News, Takata recalls BMW 3 Series cars over airbag defect. 
You have a 1999 BMW 323i or 328i. The automaker is telling you, do not drive it. In a crash, its Takata airbags could explode, sending shrapnel into the cabin or simply not inflate at all. This new Takata defect is in airbags produced between 1995 and 1999. It's been linked to at least one death and a handful of injuries worldwide. Automakers, including Toyota, Honda, and Audi, are now scrambling to figure out which makes and models will need to be recalled, along with 1999 to 2001 3 Series BMWs and 1998 to 2000 Mitsubishi Monteros. 1.4 million vehicles in all. Jason Levine from the Center for Auto Safety. Why did it take 20 plus years to find out there was a problem? It would appear that the reason they weren't discovered is because there weren't tragedies, which we can be thankful for. On the other hand, where was the quality control? A different... Yeah, well, that's interesting to think about because they didn't know. We didn't... Interesting to think about with a lot of things. That's 5G, true. 5G, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I Long-term thought... ramifications of 4G. Yeah. But I thought they already had a Takata recall. Several. Oh, my gosh. But similar defect in other Takata airbags has resulted in at least 24 deaths worldwide and forced the largest recall in auto history. Approximately 41.6 million vehicles in the U.S. alone, roughly 13.3 million airbags, still have to be replaced. Wow. Spread the word about this potentially deadly safety recall. Car makers enlisted Hollywood star power to get owners to check if their vehicle was affected. Hollywood star power? You mean Morgan Freeman? Yeah. That's a little more than Hollywood star. <laughs> I know. Like, man, how much do they have to pay him yeah. for that? He's been God in a lot of roles, you know? <laughs> Just keep that in mind. CNN Business. Takata airbag fault forces recall of another 1.4 million vehicles. The crisis caused Takata to file for bankruptcy in 2017. The Japanese company then sold most of its operations to Key Safety Systems, a Chinese-owned company based in Michigan, for $1.6 billion. U.S. federal safety regulators have previously said that it could take until 2023 for the recall to be complete, a full 15 years after the first car was ordered back to the workshop. Interesting. That's how big the recall is. It was wow. huge. Even when I worked in government, fleet management, all of our cars had the recall thing. Every, oh all all these gosh. cars, everybody's car got recalled on this one. We didn't because, you know, our cars are old, don't even have airbags in them, <laughs> but everybody has airbags in their car. It's, it hit a lot of cars. It was yeah. Uh, NBC News, paper or plastic inside the heated debate over drinking straws. Paper straws, love them or hate them, grow more prevalent every day. Businesses and local governments across the country are trying to cut down on the environmental impact of the non-degradable plastic versions. Back in 2018, Seattle became the first city to ban the use of plastic straws. Then came California and D.C. and Oregon. Now more than three dozen bills pending in 22 states. Aardvark Straws in Fort Wayne, Indiana is America. In Fort Wayne, Indiana. Wow. <laughs> I know other plastics. I know plastics manufacturers out there. Wow. And there's uh -oh. a paper straw manufacturer. Whoa, whoa. America's biggest producer of paper straws. We store them here and then we deliver them to the machines here. They say paper straws aren't bad, but you have to use them differently. Is this even working? Don't jam it. Don't stir your ice around. Don't bend it over the top because it won't go back to its... Yeah, what? Format. Don't use the straw? Wait, wait, wait. Let's hear how we're supposed to use it. Yeah. I had to cut out a lot of this because half of this, more than half of this report was a native ad for this company, whatever this oh. company is called. I don't really want to repeat it. I don't care. They make paper straws. I just want to learn. Yeah, how let's to learn how to use a paper use straw because apparently you can't use it like a plastic straw. Don't expect to use it the correct way. Here. They say paper straws aren't bad, but you have to use them differently. Is, is this even working? Don't jam it. Don't stir your ice around. Don't bend it over the top because it won't go back to its original format. Okay, so don't do anything with it, basically. Don't use yeah, the straw. Very it, gently. Don't use the straw and it'll function properly. <laughs> plastic straws suck. They're horrible. We don't. We are not pro-plastic straws here. Don't. Yeah. But we don't. I'm looking at that factory. I'm looking at that floor. And it looks exactly like plastic straw manufacturing. You have all this paper waste over here. You have a lot of crap. You have all this, you have all this waste. We don't yeah. need that. We don't, that's just, you're just creating new waste. We don't need paper straws. We don't need straws. Get rid of the straws. Why are we replacing plastic straws with paper? Why do we need the straws? Fucking drink out of the cup. Yeah. What is the problem? I, this is, ah, it, we're just generating more waste. We are, yeah. we're destroying it's, ah. And, and the other problem is they want to legislate it out. Yeah. And that's going to 
that's not good because you're going to impact jobs yeah. and all these things. So it's not smart because now you're legislating out in favor of these paper straws. These paper straws are cop- cropping yeah. up because of all the legislation favoring these paper straws. And that's the way it's working. We don't need straws, but we don't need to legislate them out. Just stop using them. Yeah, use less. <laughs> stop, you know, people carry around steel, stainless steel straws. That's cool. Use that, I guess. If that's what floats your boat, that's fine. Reusable straws are cool. Yeah. These, we don't use single, we don't need single use straws. It's wasteful. They're all, it's all wasteful. All this shit's wasteful. It's all manufactured crap that we don't need. Yeah. Healthytalkshow.com slash support. Is there more of that report? No. Oh, <laughs> well, I, cause I did want to mention, cause my, my other issue mm-hmm. is people with disabilities, they may, they sometimes need the plastic straw yeah. and the fact that they want to legislate it out that's that that that's brought up yeah you're right you're and right. It's, just let people if they need if they really need a straw just let them ask for it don't legislate it out yeah but that's yeah, another side you swing the pendulum stuff. too far on the extreme that's yeah. true yeah if you legislate it out yeah that factory looks exactly like the straw factory yeah. i used to work in the plastic straw factory it's the same st- it's the same crap. <laughs> and it looks, because didn't it seem like they had the same sleeves too? Yeah, like, they have the same everything. Yeah. It's a, it's so the same. Instead of, yeah. But it's just, it's a crappier it's product more. too. They're producing, and it probably costs more. They probably charge yeah. you more for a crappier product. But again, plastic straws suck. We agree. They're, <laughs> these single use straws need to go. What happened to save the trees now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Screw the trees. Yeah. That's what, what's right. What happened yeah. to save the trees? Because it used to be we're all paper and then we went yeah. to plastic cause we, to save the trees. But now mm, we're back on the back. Now we're back to single use. Why are we back to is single use is the problem. Yeah. That's it our, is. That's, our, that's the issue. That's our downfall. <laughs> yeah. Switching gears to Uber. NBC News exclusive. Uber shares surprising safety findings. On sexual assaults. Over the course of 2017 and 2018, the company received nearly 6,000 reports of incidents during or after Uber rides, ranging from groping to rape. That's a lot of reports of groping or rape. Yeah. Roughly four reported rapes every week, one in every five million rides. That's a hard number, but I'm not surprised. And I'm not surprised because sexual violence is just much more pervasive in society than I think most people realize. Tony West is Uber's chief legal officer, spearheading the study released today together with input from sexual violence advocates. I was surprised to read that about half of the victims are riders and the other half are drivers. That's right. And so wow. this is not just a... Yes, you, yeah. We always assume yeah. one way, but that's, that's what's interesting about the report is, yeah, it's, is... it's always always two ways. Very interesting. Another perspective now. Because now ev- both parties have to protect themselves somehow from this. How do you do that? That's true. One-sided problem. We have to keep in mind that both drivers and riders are victims. According to the study, Uber is aware of law enforcement's involvement in 37% of the reported rape cases. That number seems kind of low to me. Just 37%? I'll tell you, one of the facts about sexual assault is that it is a very underreported offense. Uber shouldn't make that choice for survivors. Survivors should make that choice for themselves. It also opens up the possibility that Uber is aware of someone who potentially raped someone else who's out in the public without involving law enforcement. As someone who is a former law enforcement official, I understand the tension. We have lots of information uh, about an incident that we will share with law enforcement if we get the consent of the victim. Very interesting. Yeah. That's a a lot of information. Uh, Want to move on? Anything else to add to this report from Uber? Yeah. It's disturbing. It is it is disturbing, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and sexual assault is always underreported, and that's disturbing. Yeah. You gotta come forward. Gotta gotta stop those people from doing that shit. Yeah, but at, at the same time, I wonder like how much data should be shared with law enforcement. Oh, Uber should be sharing none. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, it, it, I'm, she I'm was saying heavily the implying victims. That. The victims oh, should be going coming well, forward to that's law not enforcement. What she was saying, "Y'all yeah, know Uber." Sh- I'm aware of what so, she's saying. Okay. That's why. <laughs> we, why I don't know Uber should not be sharing with law enforcement. They're a private company. They need to keep that stuff private. Yeah, but people should definitely report crimes, sexual assault, and the like. Seen it. 
Ring's Neighborhoods app is revealing device locations, report says. Data found on Ring's neighborhood Neighborhoods app can reveal the exact location of the company's devices and by extent users' homes, according to Monday's report. Neighbors, a free app from the smart door- doorbell company owned by Amazon, allows users to post and comment on crime and security information in their communities. In its report, Gizmodo said it collected data over the last month linked to around 65,800 posts on the Neighbors app and found hidden geographic coordinates that are connected to each post. That includes latitude and longitude with the precision of up to six decimal points, the report says. Gizmodo said it didn't detail its methods in order to protect people's privacy, but it was able to map the locations of tens of thousands of ring cameras across 15 cities. The maps only reveal ring camera users who have agreed to share footage through the Neighbors app and who have shared footage via the app in the last 500 days, according to the report. 500 days? That's over a year. 500 days is over a year. (laughs) That's uh, that's disturbing. Yeah. They're sharing location data. Again, because... It's why do they need the data? And they, yeah. you can't. Well, <laughs> you can't protect it. And I, I remember people touting that neighbors thing as a as a big feature that oh, it's a community, and then you get a. It sounds like people just tattle on each other. Yeah, and it doesn't actually sound that helpful. But it doesn't. And then it sounds like they're getting exploited more than anything. <laughs> yeah, and it, and why does it cost money? If Amazon's taking all the video and yeah. selling its lawn and doing all this stuff, it should be free. It should really be free. Think about it. People yeah. are paying money for it too, for this damn service. I'm I'm starting to think this ring doorbell is giving everyone a false sense of security too, because now you've exposed yourself, your location. Now yeah, people now, know. Now you that think you have you're a safe, ring but actually, the smart people. Okay, there's this thing called war spying that people used to do back when they were cool hackers back in the mid 2000s ish. And what they would do is they would drive around these perverts. I wouldn't. I I know people that did it. I'm not saying I did it. It's illegal. I would not admit to any legal activity. But what you do, because everyone had these wireless cameras. Well, the problem with these wireless cameras that were coming out is they didn't have encryption on them. So you could oh, just tap no. into people's wireless cameras. You'd find wireless cameras in motels, in all kinds of weird places, gas station bathrooms. Ugh. Yeah. And I'm thinking, damn, this is creepy. But now, now, everyone's putting cameras everywhere. Yeah. You could tap into these. I'm sure. Oh. Yeah. People putting cameras in their houses. This is all stuff. And it's not even. You're just sharing too much information. Overshare, my friends. Your private information is valuable. That's why people want it. No more talking. You ready to move on to our next topic? Yeah, let's the do it. The first school shooting in North America. Global News, Ecole Polytechnic Massacre, why we remember 30 years later. December 6, 1989, the day before midterm exams at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. Just before 5 p.m., Marc Lepin walked into the engineering school with a semi-automatic rifle. Within 20 minutes, he murdered 14 women. That's Nathalie Provo, one of the survivors of the Polytechnique Montreal Massacre. He came in the class, he shot in the wall just behind me. He yelled at the guy that they have to leave the classroom. Nine women all together in the corner of the room. He told us that uh, we were there because we were feminists. And I answered him back that we were not feminists. And if he wants to study at Polytechnique, he can come with us. And then he shot. Tak, 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 tak. Pretty loud. Pretty off, it's awful. And you see, I saw the eyes of a colleague die. And then you know that you will die. You'll the, you're the next one. And it takes a second. And then you're on the floor and it's finished. Nine things. Yes. So a lot of people think Columbine's the first shooting, school shooting. This actually predates it by, I believe, 10 years. Happened in Canada. And we're going to learn a little bit more. It's the first femicide. So actually, this person, the shooter, was targeting women specifically, as you've oh. heard. Segregated, to kill, told the men leave. And whew. That's disturbing. Yes. I've never heard of it, though. No, I've, that's, what, that's the most disturbing. Yeah. That is the yeah. most disturbing part is we've never heard about this. But let's learn more. People were shot in that classroom. Six died. All women. Over the next 15 minutes, eight more people were killed. All of them 
women followed the shooting was utter chaos. Emergency responders didn't really know what to do, as this was one of the first active shooters in Quebec, and one of the first school shootings in North America. There were a number of miscommunications and delays for first responders to actually get on the scene. Police only entered the building when they got word the suspect had taken his own life, nearly 25 minutes after the first 911 call. Wow. Yikes. They just didn't know what to do. Never encountered it before. Yeah. I'm surprised that no one would try to go in, though. That's kind of shocking. Yeah, but again, it never happened before. So yeah. it's, what do you do? You're getting these calls. You think, what the heck? You know, it's, it, yeah. it's never happened. This report called the disaster plan poorly defined, and the operation as a whole suffered as a result. The media was also unsure how to handle the situation. And when he came out and said uh, that there were a dozen students that... Uh, the reporters just all got real quiet. You don't very often see reporters get quiet, but nobody said much after that. The coverage following the massacre often excluded the word feminist, unless to quote the killer. This is where things get interesting, because the, as they just said, the media coverage, for some reason, eliminates the word feminist. That's why. Hmm. It was portrayed as an individual situation, a lone gunman spun out of control. We were, we were sent out to try to find out why uh, the murderer would have done this, um, what must have happened in his childhood or his background that made him commit an act of violence. You, you, you know, do what you're told, but at the same time, there was no um, reflection on would we cover the violence against woman angle, because that seemed beside the point. Hmm. I was watching The National and, um, the late Barbara Frum was doing a, um, a special on this. And uh, you could see on a national scale that she too was trying to not make it about violence against women. You want to hear it? Yeah, that's She's very... going to... Yeah, what she describes happens right it's here. very interesting. Yeah, let's see. But, but isn't the crime, the brutality against this particular group this time, it could have been another group. Would we be having vigils for every group? If it was 14 men, would we be having vigils? Isn't violence the monstrosity here? Very strange. Yeah, I because wonder... it's violence against women, but yeah, yeah, violence is a monstrosity, but it's... I, I agree, but at yeah. the same time, it's kind of weird that you wouldn't even acknowledge yeah, it. Yeah, it's clear. <laughs> it's, uh. Yeah. Mac Lepin's motive could not have been more clear. He said it in the classroom as well as in his suicide note. But it would still take decades to call it what it was, Canada's first mass femicide. Globally, as a society, imagining that one of our boy can kill 14 of our girls is so hard to conceive, is so hard to accept. It's to see a big flaw in our society. So. I don't, I don't agree, but I understand why um, uh, people in charge wanted to diminish the division between men and women. I understand that it might have happened. I understand why feminists uh, who had strong power in time, in, in, at that time, why they were so hurt, but from my bed, from my recovery time, um, I, I, I was not involved in those discussions. Hmm. Yeah, that's. It's also interesting that they didn't take her her dis. Well, what she said that she wasn't involved yeah. in the discussion. Why? No. Why not? She was a victim. She and a survivor, and yeah, one to report on what happened. So it's kind of strange that yeah, they, the way the media covered it up in yeah. Canada. And, and then we, again, don't know anything about it. We've never heard about this. We all think Columbine, but damn. Yeah, but, but you're right. The media just kind of... Yeah, they kind of twist and finagle it however they saw fit. So yeah, they can. They can do that with any information. That's true. <sighs> you ready to roll out? Yeah, well, that's why you got to support independent media like Healthy Talk Show, where we try to remain as unbiased as possible. Absolutely. And, that remains, means that we also do not have advertisers because we don't want our uh, content to be compromised. That's right. So help us produce the show by going over to healthytalkshow.com slash support. 
Our show is value for value. And what's more valuable than knowledge? So healthytalkshow.com slash support. And realistically, how much time and entertainment do we provide you every week? We're trying to provide you an hour or two a week. You know, that's our goal. For some reason, some of the shows run long. But think about that. <laughs> hour and a half a week or so. Hey. That was five bucks a month. That's cool. I learned a lot of new things yeah, today. Yeah, think of how much it costs to go to the movies. You have to listen to ads and crap and uh, it's, uh, popcorn and dealing with the rude people. Just healthytalkshow.com slash support. We record Healthy Talk Show live on Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 3 a.m. UTC over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash live. We also have an email address, askhealthytalkshow.com. Send us an email. Call us, 509-878-3229 or healthytalkshow.com forward slash social for our social media links. Love and light. Love and light.